when we seek productivity and we do it in multiple ways it's there's techniques the pomodoro method uh there's ways to to schedule you know uh, i'm not gonna check my inbox more than twice a day and so forth um there's apps we can use productivity means more output in less time so what we do is we look at the stack of stuff we have to do and now we're compressing the time it takes so we still get the same stuff done but we reduce what it takes the thing is, we simply reduce the time, we don't reduce what we're doing. So we maintain the same set of stuff. And you probably know from engineering, the more variability you have, the more potential for problems, right? If you reduce variables, you have more streamlining. So productivity actually in, in brings about higher variability. It also, since we're compressing time, we can now stack more stuff on top of it. It's human nature. When we have some availability, we instantly find a way to fill that time. So now we have to do more stuff. And with more stuff on our plate, we need to compress it further, which is hard. When we do, we add a little bit more, we get overwhelmed. And then, God forbid, you have one problem with any of those elements and it causes this cascade effect. Like, holy crap, I didn't get that one thing done today. I now have 25 more things on my plate. So productivity rarely results in greater output for many businesses at the highest level. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today we talk about having a business that runs like clockwork. It's kind of a dream out there to have a business that really runs without you, self-managing, or just it runs so that you can actually focus on the most high value work, or you could take time off. I've done all of these things because I've read the book Clockwork. Today's guest is Mike Michalowicz. He is the author of Clockwork, also uh, Profit First, The Pumpkin Plan, and uh, many, many other books. But today we're going to talk about Clockwork, specifically the, the new and revised edition and some of the elements that he felt like needed to be added so he's bringing a new version of this to the marketplace. And today, so today we talk about how your business could run like clockwork. The biggest thing I love about this is he talks about what the QBR is and how queens, bees actually, uh, you know, are very important concept inside the way we run our businesses. You'll have to listen in to figure out what that is. And the other thing we talk about is your employees, the psychological ownership, these elements are packed into today's episode. And if there's anything that I can urge you to do, if you want your business to run more efficiently, is go check out this book, Clockwork. My friend Mike Michalowicz is a beast when it comes to writing, and, and he's even humorous if you get the audio version of this. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, but I really just wanted to make sure that uh, you understood how much I care about this content. So all that being said, enjoy today's interview with Mike Michalowicz. Mike, how are you? I'm good, Gene. How are you? I am fantastic. You've been on the show before, right? Yes, I have. We're going to talk about clockwork again. Uh, you are a prolific writer, uh, incredible business mind. Um, why keep writing so many books? So I can get on Gene Hammett's podcast um, <laughs> for some reason. Yes, and um, I I just feel this compulsion. So the longer story is I I'm on a mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And this is not just some term I came up with or something. I really struggled as an entrepreneur myself in the early years and, and still at times struggle. I just feel compelled to figure out all, all the things I F up, like how not to F those things up ever again. And when I find a solution, I feel compelled to share it with people who want to read it. So uh, admittedly, every book I'm writing is also actually primarily solving a problem I have and then feel compelled to share it if other people could be served by it. Well, we could go through the list of books that you have that have really made an impact in my life, if that would just be a brief moment here, just to, to set the stage for you, Mike. Um, one of the first ones was Pumpkin Plan. I, I think a client of mine introduced it to me and I read it and I was like, who is this guy? This quirky little hum sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, I think I listened to it audio too and just love the little added bits you gave in there. And the, Thank you. The, you're really good with audio books. You know that. Thank right? you. <laughs> uh, Pumpkin Plan. Why, why is that book such an important piece of in your library. that book um that was my second book and it what i wanted to do was teach the pareto principle the 80 20 rule but in a way that was accessible and digestible and, and perhaps a little different and, and really practical step by step i think a lot of us know the the 80 20 rule 20 percent of your clients yield 80 percent of your revenue 20 percent of your products yield 80 percent of your profitability those type of things but that's that's a great realization how do we practically deploy that knowledge and that's what i wanted to codify in the pumpkin plan and uh, that's what I did. And you're right. And I, I packaged it with my 
unique, admittedly, unique sense of humor, which doesn't resonate with everybody. But I think for the right people, it makes it even more accessible. It's like, oh, you know, business doesn't need to be that serious. I I loved it. And then you That's had cool. what I call is the <clears throat> simplest book ever. You could have written it on a three by five card but profit first, but that's been a home run for you. Why, why do you think that's resonated so much with entrepreneurs? Yeah, that, that thing is, it's just cooking. Um, yeah, I, I can't believe it. And I, I can believe it because I, I think it's been a home run because so many entrepreneurs struggle with profitability. I saw a statistic it came out by US Bank. They were doing research on their customers, um, but they identified that 83% of businesses in the US, there's 32 million now, of small businesses, that's companies that do $25 million in revenue or less, 83% are surviving check to check, meaning the owner doesn't have enough to pay themselves an appropriate salary if they do at all. There is no profit left over. When the tax bill comes, they're shocked and not prepared for it. Everything's going out the door. And what struck me is we, most of us, I think all of us start businesses in part for financial freedom. Like I don't want to worry about bills and yet it becomes our biggest worry for almost everybody. Why is that? And that's why I saw the formula, you know, when profit comes last, sales minus expense equals profit. And that formula, when profit comes last, is human nature to disregard it because anything that comes last is insignificant. If you love your family, you don't say, I put my family last. You say, I put them first. But we're told profit comes last and it's in our vernacular. It's the bottom line. It's the year end. These are all things that say, well, if you don't get it this year, maybe next year. And um, so that's what most businesses do. I wrote profit first to flip the formula so that we use the pay yourself first principle to supply to our business. Every time money comes in, take a percentage of profit and you'll know what's available to run your business. So smart. I mean, we know as at a personal level, yeah. if we put money into our savings or retirement, it would be better off to do that first and then that's spend right. the rest. Uh, and some people do it. Some people probably just still don't get the message. But then what you're talking about from a business standpoint, I think it's so simple, but yet life-changing for people. I love the fact that you make these simple books. And then now the, the book that I really do love the most, Clockwork, uh, it, it really speaks to my heart. I'm an engineer. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, I didn't know that. That's it's awesome. Called, it's called Industrial and Systems Engineering. It's the nice. number one program in the country at Georgia Tech. Uh, oh, I didn't know you were a yellow jacket. I'm a hokey. So I knew that. I knew that. Yeah, and you guys took it. Maybe I didn't know that, but I'm so embarrassed. You guys took us down solidly uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we're a sad team, but <laughs> and you're a sad team, and you yeah you're you're having a tough tough go right now, and you still kick the crap out of us. Yeah, it was a good win. Yeah. So clockwork is really a, a fantastic you know look at how businesses run efficiently. Um, but yeah. you talk about how a lot of people chase productivity. Talk to us about why productivity is not what you should be really focused on. Yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon that happens when we seek productivity and we do it in multiple ways. It's There's techniques, the Pomodoro method. Uh, there's ways to to schedule, you know, uh, I'm not gonna check my inbox more than twice a day and so forth. Um, there's apps we can use. Productivity means more output in less time. So what we do is we look at the stack of stuff we have to do and now we're compressing the time it takes. So we still get the same stuff done, but we reduce what it takes. The thing is, we simply reduce the time. We don't reduce what we're doing. So we maintain the same set of stuff. And you probably know from engineering, the more variability you have, the more potential for problems, right? If you reduce variables, you have more streamlining. So productivity actually in, in brings about higher variability. It also, since we're compressing time, we can now stack more stuff on top of it. It's human nature. When we have some availability, we instantly find a way to fill that time. So now we have to do more stuff. And with more stuff on our plate, we need to compress it further, which is hard. When we do, we add a little bit more. We get overwhelmed. And then, God forbid, you have one problem with any of those elements, and it causes this cascade effect. Like, holy crap, I didn't get that one thing done today. I now have 25 more things on my plate. So productivity rarely results in greater output for many businesses at the highest level. Now, I'm not saying don't be productive. Like I'm not saying, like, oh, square wheels were, were not working, but round wheels were, and it's more productive, but we should go back to square wheels. We definitely need to advance in productivity. That keeps you in the ballpark, but it should not be your differentiator from the competition. It'll never put you leaps and bounds ahead. It'll always keep you in the race, just won't let you win the race. You know, Mike's been talking about productivity and it really is an incredible thing to focus on with your business, but it's not the only thing. And if you're focused on just getting more productivity out of your day, then you're going to miss the big picture. I find a lot of the CEOs I work with, a lot of people who invest a lot of money can easily be explained in some of their issues by their focus on the wrong thing. So if you're focused on, you know, getting more out of your day and, you know, having your meetings run a little bit sharper and whatnot, 
you're probably going to miss the boat because you cannot really engineer your life to focus on the most valuable things unless you're willing to let go and, and empower those around you. I say this because I study leadership. I study people and companies that are really successful inside this world. And I, I'm going to remind you, productivity is only a small sliver of the impact that it makes. It's the shift in the way they think. It's the strategies. It's the way they empower people and all of the stuff that goes around that. That's what drives businesses forward. Back to Mike. So there's a, a logical bit to me of, of why we should talk about systems. Um, yeah. You named this book Clockwork. Yeah. And it's, I think, a perfect name because we want our businesses to run like clockwork. And yeah. this is the revised edition. Uh, why did you have to revise an edition that I loved the first time? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, if I knew that, if I knew you loved it, I was left in the same. <laughs> but um, other people didn't love it. I thought they didn't love it. But uh, I'm really lucky, Gene. I get, I get feedback from readers, um, kind and critical, but really rarely hurtful. But the critical feedback was, there's a couple of things. Confusion over certain concepts. The QBR is like one of the most important elements of clockwork. And I consistently got people saying, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to implement it. Help me. And uh, I said, okay, I need to simplify this in my subsequent revisions. The other thing, and this one really opened my eyes. I got a call from an entrepreneur and uh, actually left a message. And the message said, I love clockwork. I want to do this. I can't tell my employees because there's this concept of fortification. I'm going to leave and all my employees are going to stay behind. I'm abandoning my team. So I can't teach it to them. I'm sorry, but I love your book. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, that's the exact opposite of what message I'm trying to get across. This is an empowerment mechanism for your team. They need to read it to, to elevate themselves, to really flourish. And so in the rewrite, every chapter has a section specifically for the empowerment of employees in this process, among other tweaks to the systems. Well, you went past that QBR. I know you're very close to what you're doing. You're referring to the queen bee role. Yeah. Uh, but let's go back up because you had an interesting story about you know bees and how they relate to businesses. Go ahead and share that with us today. Yeah. So I, I use a technique occasionally in my books called biomimicry. And the idea behind biomimicry, Gene, is you look at a protocol or something in your business or life that you want to improve. And before you ponder how to improve it or investigate that, you look outside of your circle and specifically look at nature. And the idea is that Mother Nature's figured out a lot of stuff over billions of years, and she's pretty freaking good at efficiencies and, and developing concepts. And if I can find something that runs parallel to what I want to do in my life or my business, maybe I can take her ideology. Well, I found that beehives are really efficient at scaling. And you may notice one day you see a wasp or a bee flying around, and the next day there's a whole nest that's formed. It's because they're they're so organized. Well, among all the different roles they serve, those bees defending the hive, collecting nectar or pollen, and so forth, the most critical function that the survivability of the entire hive depends on is the production of eggs. It's the the heart of the the organization. And every bee knows that if eggs aren't being produced efficiently, we're all done. Bees die pretty quickly, so you can't just sustain. You have to produce eggs. Now, the analogy breaks down a little bit here in that in a beehive, there's one bee that produces eggs. It's called the queen bee. I'm not saying that in an organization, there's one person who is the producer, the ultimate producer. What I'm saying is the QBR, I got to emphasize R, the role. It's the role of egg production. We got to figure out in our business, what is the singular most important activity that produces the core results that keeps our business thriving? And most businesses don't know this. And as a result, we touch on it out of just a natural course. But since we haven't defined it, we don't deliberately focus on it. So we touch on it. We touch on other things. We put many things on the equal status or equal plateau. And therefore, most businesses never break through. We're always stuck at whatever that number may be, but we don't get to the next level. My research and what I argue in the book is once we know the number one thing we do, if that's always protected, if we perfect that, the other things... We got to be doing adequately, but they don't be perfect. But the QBR, it's got to be damn perfect. And your business will will really soar. You know, Mike's been talking about systems here. And I'd like to back up for a second, because I think there's three elements that help your business run really well. And I look at these is every business has them. One, it's the leader. That's you. You've got to be able to lead people effectively. And many people aren't really leading. And, and that's the problem. But you also have to have a team. If you want to scale your business, it's not just you anymore. It has to be others around you. 
you could have, there are some exceptions to this and, and maybe you can find those rare exceptions. But I think that you should be looking at how do you bring in people, the right people and develop them and create a culture where they're doing their best. That is the second part is you, the first being the leader and the second is the team. The third one's the systems. We've been talking about it with them, but I, I'll give you my perspective. You've got to have the foundational systems that allow your business to run efficiently, but then you've got to have those SOPs. Now we get into the details, clockwork and, and the conversation we're having today is getting into the details of those SOPs and the concepts around that, which are extremely powerful, but you want to make sure that there's a bigger picture behind this, the leader, the team, and the systems. And one thing I loved to, to remind everyone of, you shouldn't be the one driving the effectiveness of those systems. It should be your team. You should empower them to do that. And that will give you the company you want, the one that runs like clockwork. All right, back to Mike. I know I use this concept within my own business and, and it was really around my podcast. You know, we've produced over 900 episodes and we get pitched about 400 uh, a month or more. Wow. It's an incredible amount of people who, who want to be on the show, which is great. Yeah. We rarely take any of them. Well, last we month really I pitched in. you 401 times, so it worked. You Well, you got in because you're a friend, but we have a system behind yeah. who we invite to come on the show, what we're looking for. So and smart. We walk them through a process and we've improved that over the over time. And it has worked for us tremendously. And your book highlighted the fact that systems are such a critical element to our business and it, I've empowered others around me. And we, and we talk yeah. about this being the number one system and how everything else is kind of subservient to it. We still had to get these other things done, but we don't want, we don't want this to fall apart as the podcast. That's a great example. It's a great example because yeah. it points to that system. I assume yields a certain quality of guests, certain uh, content they're going to produce or the way they, they present themselves or perhaps a combination thereof. Imagine you didn't have that system and it's like, ah, oh, what, you know, I got 400 pitches. We'll just randomly pick one. How would your show be affected? I presume the guests wouldn't be nearly as effective or good. Maybe they wouldn't yeah. be consistent with the theme of the show and it instantly tanks. The funny thing is, say you didn't produce as well. Maybe the audio level isn't good. It's an amazing guest, but the audio levels are off. That doesn't tank a show. Yeah, some your listeners will be like, hey, it didn't sound right, but the content is still rich, so they'll stay. And that's the idea of the QBR. The example I use is with FedEx because it's a global brand. Everyone knows that FedEx promises to deliver packages on time. Well, the activity, the QBR is always an activity, qualifying guests. In, in FedEx's case, the QBR is to ensure logistics are in place. So it's, it's the movement of packages, ensure that packages are delivered on time. Now, FedEx could say, you know, we also have a customer service department. Let's screw logistics. Let's ramp up customer service. FedEx would go out of business, you know, within weeks, the headlines would come out saying, you know, FedEx doesn't know where a single package is, but they're really friendly about it. Like it doesn't matter. They're out of business. But if you flip it, I think this is the most interesting part. If FedEx says, you know what, screw customer service, everyone's doing logistics. Let's get those packages delivered on time no matter what. Now the headline is FedEx stopped answering phones, but every package still delivered on time. They may be crippled a little bit, but they ain't going out of business. In the first scenario, a multi-billion dollar corporation, stick a fork in them, they're done if those packages aren't being delivered on time. You believe in systems so much that you probably run your life and your business around this. What do you think <clears throat> people don't understand about systems that are just a basic level that you could share, shed light on? Yeah, I, I use systems a lot. I, and I think the thing I didn't realize is it's really a powerful form of freedom because it sounds the opposite, that it's controlled and containing. But what it does is controls and contains the iterative or repetitive processes. And I think the true definition of human expression is creativity. Um, or whatever version we have of that. And for me, creativity comes out through verbal expression, you know, speaking and so forth, writing. The more systems I'm in place, uh, the more I've been freed up to do what I'm passionate about, which is the writing and the speaking and the creativity. Now, here's the most interesting part. I've systemized that too. I have a co-writer, people that help me in the writing process, because I don't want to be the sole producer that if I'm not producing eggs that the business stops. So I have AJ Harper is her name, who works with me in parallel constantly. So there's there's two people pulling those eggs forward, if you will. Speaking, we now have, I think, 40 or 50 people who speak predominantly on profit first, but my other topics too, clockwork and so forth, who are actively out there speaking. So I'm not needed for that. And the best part then is when I'm not needed, then I can do it in a joyful way. I can, we were talking about speaking earlier, you can kind of cherry pick the things you want to do, like you're, you're doing. And that for me is very joyful. When you get to do work because you want to, as opposed to you need to, oh my gosh, that's when you really excel. I want to wrap our 
thing up today around you're talking about empowerment because I really I think systems are an incredible piece of the business. I think about all the stuff and how our business runs efficiently and how we've scaled up. It's because of systems and Clockwork was a, a really incredible book for that. But the business owner should not be the the owner of the systems. I think the people within the organization should be those owners. They should be the ones that are identifying them. They should be the ones that are improving them over time. They should be the ones that are, you know, innovating where necessary or, or cutting steps. Um, would you agree to that? My gosh, I love that. Yes. I'm doing research for my next book we were talking about offline, which is really about employee empowerment in part. And what I found is this concept called psychological ownership. There was deep research done on this, I think in the 80s. Um, and it still exists, but the deployment in the business space has been inadequate, in my opinion. And what they found is that when someone has control over an outcome, when someone can um, give personal direction to it, they have the ability to personalize it even, um, when they have more and more knowledge of it, they feel a greater sense of ownership. When we have greater ownership, we're more vested in its success. And the funny thing is ownership in this psychological sense doesn't translate to physical or legal ownership. So I'll give you an example. My, uh, uh, I own Ford, a stock in Ford, for example, and I, so I'm a legal owner in the company Ford. I've never driven by a Ford factory and go, that's my company. You know, I don't rush over to help Ford. So I have legal ownership. Conversely, I have a Ford pickup truck. That's my car. And, um, I don't actually own it. It's, it has a bank note. I'm paying my installments. So it's owned by the bank, but I have psychological ownership. I have the ability to control it, right? S literally steer it. I've personalized it for me. You know, you put a, the, the dice on the mirror or whatever, and I, I know it intimately. So it feels like it's part of me. And so the way I treat that car is way different than I would treat like a rental as an example. The opportunity is with our colleagues. If, if they have an opportunity to control and, and personalize, they'll take greater ownership over it and bring greater care to it. And I found one of the key indicators is that they start saying, this is mine or our, this is our company, as opposed to your company. This is my job, as opposed to, I got to do this job. Those are all indicators that someone has psychological ownership. And to your point, they'll start elevating. So give them PO, psychological ownership over things like the tasks and responsibilities, uh, even idea creation. Don't tell them what to do. Say, here's a vision I have. What's your vision? What are your ideas to guess that vision? Now they've created those ideas. They have psychological ownership, much more likely to see it through. So yeah, ownership ownership may be everything. You know, we got to get together and talk more because a lot of the speeches I give have been talking about how fast growth companies, which is who we focus here on the podcast, the Inc. 5000 founders, CEOs, fastest growing companies out there, uh, they want people to feel like owners. Right. As I was really going to write the book called uh, employees acting like owners. Cause that's what people say. like, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, we changed the title after testing, but that is it. I want my employees to act like owners. And the beautiful thing is they can without actual ownership. Here's the greatest irony. Just a little asterisk to add is uh, I've talked to people about ESOPs and so forth. The interesting thing about legal ownership, it's not always the case, but in many cases, when an employee has legal ownership in the business, it's a small piece of pie, they actually don't take more active ownership. They start taking active entitlement. Like, you owe me now. So it actually demotivates people, which is shocking. So I explore all that in this next book. I can't wait to read that one, too. You have to come back on. I'd be honored, brother. Today, we've been talking about the new and revised edition of Clockwork. I want to suggest that you guys go check it out because if you want your businesses to run more efficiently so that you can go on vacation like a, for a month like I did, uh, which is talked about inside the book, you want to make sure that you check out Mike's latest uh, edition of Clockwork. Anything else, Mike? That was it, brother. Thank you so much. What a fantastic interview. I love having friends on the show because the energy is just so sharp and so good. And Mike is such an incredible insight for this. Hopefully you enjoyed talking about how your business can run like clockwork with the author of Clockwork, Mike Michalowicz. Um, if there's anything I can do for you, make sure you check out the free content at genehammer.com. And if you're thinking about leadership training for your teams, make sure you check out the free material that we have over there at genehammer.com and be happy to help you. When you think about growth and you think about leadership, think about growth, think tank. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.